Laurie Power, Director of Lifelong Faith Formation at Christ the Redeemer Parish. Welcome to Talking Saints. I'm here today with my co-host, Pete Sanchez, reporter for the Catholic Star Herald, and we'll be spending just a few minutes talking about a particular saint and how his or her example can inspire us, because as Pope Francis reminds us, to be saints is not a privilege for the few, but a vocation for everyone. How are you, Pete? Hey, I'm doing well, Lori. How are you? Good. Good, Great good. to see you. Um, just glad to be here talking about another saint. Yeah, this is one that fairly I fairly recent. Yeah, yeah one I um, that might not be maybe familiar. I'm not certain. I, he was not familiar to me. Mm. Um, of course, uh, we're, we're uh, today is October 11th. So, who are we speaking about? We are talking about Pope Saint John the 23rd. Oh, the good Pope John. Good Pope John. Yeah, you that's what they called him. Was was he ordained at the same day or canonized the same day as John Paul II? He was. I believe. Yeah. Yes. So, in the back of my head, I think those two are linked, and you'll see they are linked because uh, John Paul II actually beatified John the Twenty Third. I believe that's amazing. And they're linked <laughs> and in they another were, way too. Which how we'll, else? Well, let's not spoil it yet. All right. Okay. But the uh, so what we know? Uh, yeah, he's a relatively new pope. He was born almost. Uh, sh- should we just dive in? Is Go that what we're it. doing here, Lori? We're just going to get right into the thick of it. Uh, <laughs> so John, the good, good Pope John, was born Angelo Roncalli. He was born on uh, November twenty fifth, eighteen eighty one, to a family of sharecroppers. In Italy, and how many and children did they eventually have? Pete, I think he was a third of fourteen. Thirteen. I Thirteen. Think. That's amazing. Yeah, firstborn um, son. Yeah, and he, um, and he just he grew up. He he was uh, I think was a f- kind of a farmer. He lived that rural lifestyle, mm-hmm. and then we talked about it, Lori. He entered the seminary really young. Well, I mean, I guess maybe in that time, not really young. Here we would say. It's young. Yeah. Now, the age times, of 12, yes. 12 years old in Bergamo. Um, and I believe he had a scholarship, yes. right? And uh, uh, Well, that's how he was able to go and study in Rome that's because right. of a scholarship. So, and yeah. then something happened. He got taken away, right? Do you want to? Yes. I believe you were telling me he, uh, his brother was drafted and he um, offered to take his bro- brother's yes. place and serve in the Italian army. Because his and, brother was needed at home, and I guess, right. I don't know what that means for Angelo. Like, I guess they didn't need him. <laughs> well, um, I guess he could take a break from the seminary and then was able to go back. Yeah, so. I guess, you know, maybe maybe that, maybe that was the thing, because if Angelo didn't go in the army, he would have stayed in the seminary. Right. So it made sense they needed still another farmhand. Mm. So it does, and then he... Um, and he went back to seminary, so that was good. He did, he did, and uh, but he seemed to be. Um, he returned to get. A, he got a doctor of theology, mm-hmm. and he was ordained in his early twenties, I believe, nineteen oh four, almost a yes. hundred years ago. And then, uh, and then he wasn't he with the. He was appointed soon. He was appointed secretary to the bishop, right? Yes, the new bishop of Bergamo. What What did he do there? Um, that, I think was he was like? so. so Apparently, the bishop was very social minded, so um, he got a lot of firsthand experience of you know working with the um, like some of the issues faced by the working class, which will be important later. We'll see um, in his encyclicals that he so writes. Take notes. <laughs> Apparently, he was also teaching apologetics, church history, and patristics as well, which is study of the church fathers. Yeah. So. And then, and then Italy, you know, another theme. Then he went back, back yeah, again in back 1915, into, yeah, during World War One. World War One, and he uh, he was drafted as a sergeant in the medical corps. He became a medic, and then soon became a chaplain to wounded soldiers. And as you'll see, his his pastoral heart was well mm. on display here. Um, he he really encountered, as you'll see, you, you know, he he encountered so many people in his life, and this kind of continuing the uh the i don't want to say a public relations tour but just the people were getting to know him and he was starting to make a name and helping these individuals and then when the war ended he opened a i believe a house a like hostel, a hostel for, for students, students yeah. of for seminary students or was it just young youth i'm not sure i know he was also appointed spiritual director for the seminary so okay, maybe, maybe it was like a what, hostel near the seminary yeah, but for everyone he, so i'm sorry no go ahead yeah, yeah, he, was pro- i think it was for everyone not just the seminarians. And then he was called to something higher, right? The Holy See, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Apparently, uh, he may, must have had some good uh, 
skills of organization because he was called to Rome to reorganize the society for the propagation of the faith. So that seems like a pretty big job um, for a fairly young priest. Then he became a papal dip- diplomat in 1925. So first in Bulgaria, um, then in Turkey. He actually set up an office in Istanbul for locating prisoners of war. So again, we see that heart for those who who are in need. And then finally in France, he assisted with the church's post-war efforts there. So he had a fairly long um, term of service as a diplomat. Yeah, and he, um, let me just pull my notes. Yeah, he, um, one of the things during World War II, I think he mentioned the, uh, how many thousands? He assisted several thousand. 24,000 Jewish people, yeah. Yeah, He estimated as helping to save them. Yeah, yeah, he helped them escape the Holocaust. He provided them uh, with forged baptismal certificates and visas. Mm -hmm. And to help them escape. And uh, years later, you know, not only the Catholic Church had recognized him by that he's a saint, but also the state of Israel. 2011, not 15 years ago, he was posthumously awarded the honor righteous among the nations. Mm. So that's a big deal. I mean, it is, yeah. for a pope to, you know, not when he was pope. And I think, too, we have to mention that he was named a bishop and, um, he chose his, when he was named a bishop and assigned as the apostolic visitor to Bulgaria, he chose his episcopal motto. I'm going to butcher this. I'm just going to say this in English. I apologize. <laughs> okay, go for it, Pete. What? Go for it. English well, is you, the way to know, go. Do you know what I, I said? I don't, no, uh, don't want to. Um, I took Latin for three years in high school, and I apologized to all my teachers. Uh, <laughs> I do not remember this, um, but it was obedience and peace. Mm. which was a fitting theme, as you'll see later on in life. So, uh, And you mentioned, too, so he did, he was um, post-war, he was up to Nuncio to France, right? Mm-hmm. And so he, he helped out a lot with that. Yes. And then, finally, in 1953, he was named a cardinal and appointed patriarch of Venice. So it, it was like he had a, he became a residential bishop, finally. <laughs> Not, uh, it wasn't traveling, wasn't uh, a diplomat anymore. And he thought, or he expected to spend his last years there doing pastoral work. Um, and he was actually, he, I think he convened the first diocesan synod there. And he was uh, working on correcting some of the, the proofs of the documents from that synod when he was called to Rome to participate in the conclave that would eventually elect him pope. Mm-hmm. So his uh, his final years did not unfold quite as he expected. <laughs> no, I mean, if I'm trying to put myself in his shoes. Like, he was 76 years old. Mm. He had lived a life where he grew up as a sharecropper with his family. He saw the horrors of combat mm-hmm. and war and military and helped these women and men. He he saw the, uh, the horrors of, you know, the Holocaust. The Holocaust yeah. And... He uh, he had helped seminary students, and he that's a lot to do. And he had also he had also been part of the scene, the diplomatic scene, right? Because people knew him, and he was getting the message known about the church. And he just I mean that's a full life already. And that for is true. Se- for seventy six <laughs> to get thrust into I mean in God's wisdom, yeah, uh, he was named. He, he was called Pope, and he took the name uh, because of his father, John. Giovanni. Yeah. Yes. And, um, Apparently, and, he uh, people said he took his work seriously, but not himself, and had a very good sense of humor. So perhaps that was how he was able to embrace this very big responsibility um, so late in life. I think that's the only way that somebody can embrace that responsibility. I mean, at least that's what I would hope. I don't know, me at least. I don't think I'll ever be Pope, but... That's not so bad to take the work seriously, but not yourself. I think that's a it's good, true. just a, that's a little nugget to take away from here. And and you, uh, you can see even from his first address, um, he just had a heart for pastoral work. So um, in his coronation address, he asserted vigorously and sincerely that it was his intention to be a pastoral pope, since all other human gifts are and accomplishments, learning, practical experience, diplomatic finesse can broaden and enrich pastoral work, but they cannot replace it. So that's what he said in his uh, first address as Pope, that the pastoral work is the most important. Because even all of those other skills, the learning he received, even his diplomatic finesse, as he called it, cannot replace um, having a heart for the people. 
And I think that's interesting because uh, um, in some ways I can get bogged down in being trying to be book smart. Mm. And I think, you know, you can read all the textbooks of the world, but really it's that personal connection that we make with other humans um, on this earth. Uh, personal encounters. That is, uh, to me at least, I try to remember that, that that's the most important, important thing I'm ever going to do. Not spout out, you know, how much I know about Star Wars or something. <laughs> that's um, true. But if people don't know Star Wars, watch the movies because they're awesome. Um <laughs> But no, I, I just, and I think that's such a, a way. He seemed to be a Pope who, who said he was going to do something and then he did it. It's interesting. Yeah. So he said he's going to be pastoral and he was the first Pope to visit the Regina, Regina Celli Jail, which is in Rome. So he went and he visited prisoners oh. there. Um, he visited sick children in Bambino Jesu Hospital. And some of the kids actually thought that he was Santa Claus <laughs> because, you know, St. Nic- Nicholas was a bishop. So the <laughs> the clothing, I guess, would be similar if he was wearing the red. So, yeah, they confused him for, uh, I believe they call Santa Claus Daddy Christmas in Italy. So that's who they thought he was. <laughs> that is oh, that just speaks to his jovial <laughs> yes. appearance and nature. You I see, think you, so. You, you should look at photos. We have a photo, of course, with this podcast. And you can tell that he just was a smiley just a good, warm-hearted man and good pope. And he only, he, he did a lot. He was pope for four and a half years. Yes. And uh, in apparently less than three months after he was elected, he announced he would hold a diocesan synod for Rome. He would convoke an ecumenical council for the universal church and revise the code of canon law. So in less than three months, he's like, here's what I plan to do. And they, people thought, oh, he's just going to be a transitional pope. He's just going to be, yeah. I think they called it like a caretaker pope. <laughs> he's not going to do much because he's a little bit older. He'll have a short um, reign as pope. But even though it was short, he uh, he didn't waste any time. No, he didn't. He he hit the ground running. And, and two of his most important encyclicals are Mother and Teacher, uh, mm-hmm. where he talked about the church's role in uh, social progress. Social justice, and this was yeah. time when there was really technological change, technological change, and you saw increasing social and economic inequality. And then the second was Peace on Earth, where uh, it dealt with rights, responsibilities of all peoples, human dignity, and the right, I'm sorry, I butchered that, the human dignity and the rights and responsibilities of everybody to seek peace and harmony throughout the world. Mm. So he saw, he reached out his arms to everybody. That is true. And he did go ahead and the three things that he wanted to accomplish. Uh, the, f- the first synod in Rome was held in 1960. Of course, the Second Vatican Council, as we now know it, was convoked in 1962. Um, he opened it, but of course, as we know, he would not um, see its conclusion because he passed before the end of it. Um, but then in 1963, the Pontifical Commission for the Revision of the Code of Canon Law uh, was appointed. So <laughs> all the things he set out to do, even though he was only Pope for a couple of years, he was able to, by the grace of God, accomplish them. Yeah. So he, um, yeah, he he lived he lived uh, his life before and then. Even though, like you said, he was Pope for not five years, he did so much in that time he transformed. And people, you know, you mentioned before that John Paul beatified him, right? Yes. John Paul II. Mm-hmm. Uh, scholars say that although John the Twenty Third he initiated it and John Paul II implemented it, I'm referring to the uh, the Second Vatican Council, the, uh, you know, in terms of John Paul II right. saw He's it sir, yes. through He's, right. after... Um, and I think that was uh, it was prescient for John the Twenty Third to he uh, he, right, he I was mean, looking never, ahead. He was looking. He's like, yeah. now is the time. I think that's one of the quotes even from when he opened the council or during the council that you know we, now is the time to to look ahead. <laughs> we need to um, plan for the future of the church and you how know, the church interacts with the world. And I have to say, Lori, I won't tie this in because I believe I saw you at the. Diocese's Blue Mass. Oh, yes. Recently, yeah. yeah. So in our diocese here, there's what they call a Blue Mass, which honors law enforcement and uh, first, responders. first responders. And the deacon gave a fantastic homily about, uh, do you remember, Lori, about the infinite mm-hmm. game? And I think that it basically the infinite game is what we understand to be um, how uh, how we should recognize that we're, we're infinite players in an infinite game and that this life is going to keep going on after us. It is God in control. And so I think that's about John the 23rd. He realized that 
he was going to pass on. So he wanted to make this place better for those that came mm. after him. He realized things would not end after he left. So he started this, and who knows if he knew that he would die so soon. Right, yeah, um, that's true. But he, he didn't waste any time. No, he Either didn't. Way. <laughs> and I think that's maybe a good lesson for us to wherever we are at stages in life, you know, you know, start what you think is on your heart. Do what's on your heart because you never know who you're going to influence, who's going to pick up that ball. Mm. I, I just, I mean, imagine if he just thought, no, I'm not feeling too well. Right. I'm not going to do this. <laughs> like he, he had that foresight and we're all, I, I, do believe in a lot of ways the church is better for it. Mm, absolutely. And he did say, so at the, he sort of set the tone for the council when it was opened. He said, the church has always opposed errors, which in the past, the ecumenical councils would often gather to correct errors that had come up. Um, but he said, the church has always opposed errors. Nowadays, however, the spouse of Christ prefers to make use of the medicine of mercy rather than that of severity. So you can see his fatherly heart and a desire to, you know, show mercy to those as opposed to severity to those in all of us. All of us need mercy. So I think he was emphasizing that, that that's the way forward for the church. Very St. Faustina like. Yes. <laughs> you go listen to that podcast after this. That's right. Listen to that yeah. one. Um, that was October 5th. So yeah, you can there, find her oh, a couple yeah. years ago. There you go. Another October saint. There right? you go. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and uh, I think, yeah, do you have, uh, do you have a, a final prayer? I or do. About... So we should probably, I just wanted to share one thing about okay. his, uh, so he actually died of cancer. Um, so he yeah. knew that his death was imminent. And apparently even when he was sick, he retained his sense of humor because he said to someone, well, my bags are packed and I'm ready to go. So <laughs> he was That's prepared right. for death. Um, and he died on June 3rd, 1963 of stomach cancer. Um, and then of course was beatified in 2000 by uh, St. John Paul II and then canonized in 2014 alongside uh, Pope St. John Paul II. And it was really beautiful. Um, and w one of the things I was reading, the uh, a simple caption uh, after his death in a, maybe a small newspaper really captured um, his warmth and, and the effect that he had on the world, really. And the caption simply read, a death in the family. So he was beloved and it felt like everyone lost a family member when he passed away. I think that captures his his spirit. Yeah, he really had the, the a heart for everybody, and mm. everybody knew that. That is um, true. Just what an incredible legacy. And I, th I believe, too, I, I see here he's a patron saint of papal, de papal delegates. Oh, that makes sense. I'm not certain, though. <laughs> Since he was um, the, the diplomat for a while. Though. <laughs> yeah, I'm not certain what else he's, he's patron saint of, but... Mm. Um, yeah, that's something. Maybe we'll maybe in the in the show notes we'll we'll, we'll include his we'll who he's patron of. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All so, right. Shall we close with the prayer? Uh, that sounds great. All right. O oh God of mercy and love, we thank you for the gift of your son Angelo Roncalli, Pope John the Twenty Third, and for the honor of sainthood the Church has bestowed upon him. Through the gifts of joyfulness, goodness, and humility, he led the Church into the modern world. He taught us the need for peace in the world, which can only be achieved through the recognition of human dignity. He called us to work for a more just world. This holy man inspired us to live the gospel, to love deeply, and to show compassion to persons who are poor and suffering. We pray in thanks for his peaceful spirit. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Pope St. John the Twenty Third, pray for us. Pray for us.